So uh, I was on a flight a couple days ago coming from Honduras, Hon you hear how I said it, Honduras, to uh, Dallas. For the first time in my life, lightning struck the plane. It went pow, really loud. And then whew, a big old flash. <laughs> I sat there on this plane, and I promise you, I was thinking, okay, it's time for me to go. I was thinking it. And inside my heart, I was going, yeah, let's go. I'm going to get to see Jesus face to face. It's going to be awesome. Nobody on the plane was smiling except for me. So I look over at the lady sitting next to me. She does not speak English. No English. English. I said, Jesus Cristo, perdone me pecados. I don't know. I know I just used a verb there, but I don't know verbs in Spanish. I just know just enough to cause trouble. Uno pecado inferno. <laughs> I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to, where are my Spanish speaking people in the house? I don't know how to do it. I'm going, Jesus Cristo, no pecados, no verbs. Uno pecado inferno, Jesus Cristo, Jesus Cristo, and I use the verb, perdono mi pecado, enter my vida, enter mi corazón, and I start sharing. She's going, and everybody around, I'm trying to, how do I get the gospel out in a spot where everybody is thinking, about the end of their life. Every, the, the play was going, oh God, oh my God. And I was just going, let's go. I was taking roller coaster. I know that sounds crazy to y'all, but that's just the way, that's just the way I view, I, I, I've had a view of life. I know for a fact one of these days I'm going to die. It's been appointed for me once to die, then to face judgment. I forget what that verse is, Hebrews 9.46 or something like that. So I know it's going to happen. I know that it's going to happen, <laughs> and I know all of us are going to face that. So wouldn't it be great? Now, I did a paper in seminary here. Dr. Mullen was my professor in hermeneutics. Anybody ever had hermeneutics? Raise your hand. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Yes. Greatest class I ever took, other than all the other classes. Great class. I use hermeneutics every day I study the Bible. Open the Bible. I'm thinking hermeneutics. Context is king. I asked Dr. McCook one time, if I teach a seminar on hermeneutics, what should they get out of it? Context is king. He told, context is king. That's the job. That's it. That, so, so I did a paper in hermeneutics on this book. It's in chapter 3 of John. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 3. I did a, a paper in this. I don't know what percentage of the of the grade it was, but I got 105 on the paper. I don't know why he gave me five extra credit points, but I got 105 on the paper. I, I've used that paper hundreds of times since then, preaching the gospel. Preach a, I figure, what's the best way to punch the enemy in the face when we face bad news? What's the best way? One time I was in a restaurant, my, my boss, Rob, uh, 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 Dwight Robertson, of my ministry for, of the ministry I'm part of Forge, and, and our CFO, uh, Dr. Todd Bright, or not Dr. Todd Bright, and my wife were there, and we had probably the worst waitress I've ever had in my life. There was no ice in our sweet tea. No, that's, that's straight from the hot spot. You understand what I'm saying? No ice in our sweet tea. No, she, she, would bump, she bumped into my president. He went into his food like this. No apology, no nothing. So I'm thinking, she wants Jesus. So I said, man, this is going to sound really weird, but right now the Lord God Almighty in all of his infinite glory, the Lord God Almighty is especially fond of you. He thinks you're amazing. You know how when you walk in a room, you see somebody you really like, and your heart goes, oh, oh, oh. the Lord God Almighty's heart just, just jumped for you. He thinks you're awesome. She went, what? And backs away from me. I said, yeah, I figure I'm in now. All I got to do is fish, just fish, keep fishing, keep fishing. Somebody's gonna, something's going to be biting, so just keep throwing the line there as much as you can. So she backs up and goes, huh? Then she said, how do you know that? I go, ha, ha, ha. I mean, I didn't do that on the outside. I did that on the inside. I said, well, here's the thing. I'm probably the worst sinner in the room because I'm the oldest. See my hair? I'm the oldest. I know more about sin. The only one older is uh. Dr. Jones over here. I'm just, <laughs> sorry. All, all I know is, is we're old people, so we know more about sin than y'all young people do. I mean, I know I'm insignificant. I understand that concept. I know about my own sin stuff. So I told her, he forgave me of all my sins. That's a lot of sins. He'll forgive you too. She goes, 
and walks away from us. Goes over there and starts writing something down and uh, brings it back to me. And my wife said, she's bringing you a letter. I said, I don't know. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. She hands me a letter and it says, you don't know me. This was my last day at work. I bought all the materials to take my life tonight. But when you told me Jesus was fond of me, something in my heart clicked. Can you lead me to the Lord? You ever eat a big juicy steak? That's what that felt like. Just, oh my God, oh my God. She starts, so she became the greatest waitress ever. I mean, ice in our sweet tea, straight from the Holy Spirit. So I'm just saying, we got, in football stadiums around the world, you have 85,000 people desperately in need of exercise, and 22 players desperately in need of rest. You know what I call that? The church. It's time for us to get on the field, figure out a way to take our fist and punch the enemy right in the face. How are we going to do that? How are we going to... It's in John chapter 3. Jesus, the, the only place in the entire Bible where the definition we're believing given is John 3, 14. I'm not going to, there's a lot of humor in this message. I'm not going to do the humor. We're just going to get right to the point. In John chapter 3, verse 14, it's the only place in the entire Bible where the definition we're believing is given. I've read the Bible through. I'm on my 40th time reading the Bible through. This year is my 40th anniversary. I love, I love saying that. I'm not bragging. The lights are on in my house, but nobody's home. I'm not bragging. I'm a couple bricks short of a load, a few fries short of a Happy Meal, elevating them to the top floor. I'm dumb as a log. Got a 770 on the SAT. Combined. Got a 15 on the ACT. Don't ask me how I got into college. I'm just saying the Word of God has blessed my socks off. So I know this is the only place in the entire Bible where the definition of the word believe is given. If you believe like this, you'll spend eternity in heaven. If you don't, you won't. It's not because God doesn't want you in heaven. He wants everyone in heaven. God wants all men everywhere to be saved. But people are choosing not to believe, and so... Hell that was created for the devil and his demons is being populated by people who don't believe. They don't do John 3.14. John 3.14 says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. Verse 15, that everyone who believes would have everlasting life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world. Very famous verse. Everybody in here knows it. You've been brought up on it. But 14, very few people know it. I've been preaching this message for about 35 years since I've been in school here. And about four or five people in total have known 314 in the churches. See, 314 is the key verse. Jesus is talking to a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a teacher of the teachers. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the leader. Probably, I don't know for sure, I've heard all the stories, I've read the books on it, but probably had the New Old Testament memorized. Especially the first five books, the Pentateuch. And so Jesus says to this Nicodemus guy, Nicodemus comes to him and says, we know you're from God because you couldn't do the things you do unless you're from God. Jesus tells him he has to be born again. The most intense moment in my life was when my wife snapped the knuckle in my hand, popped the knuckle out of my hand, just snapped it right up, broke my hand, giving birth to our daughter, Rachel. She screamed at the top of her lungs, I hate Eve. It was the most intense thing I've ever seen. Praise the Lord, I am not a woman. Pray women are the toughest people on the planet. Praise Jesus for you ladies. Praise the Lord for y'all. I mean, I'm just saying, us, us guys, we ain't, <laughs> we ain't tough like y'all are. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. He's telling the teacher of teacher, the leader of leaders, you have to be born again. Being born's intense. It's not just, oh, sure, yeah. Why would I bring that up in a seminary, Bible college setting? Why would I bring up you have to be born again. I remember when, I just remember, I remember when I was in school here, a, a, a pastor from Greenville, South Carolina came down here and preached on being born again. And I'm sitting in the back going, ha, 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 yes! As a believer, I thought, please make sure our seminary Bible college people are saved. Please make sure. Because we don't know our days. They're, they're numbered by God. We don't know the number. So why not make sure it's my job? I, I'm not going to apologize for doing what God has called me to do. I've got to tell you this message. 
to make sure. Now, why is it a significant issue? Because many of you, raise your hand if you know your parents are saved. Raise your hand if you know your parents are saved. Your parents are saved, raise your hand. Look around, almost everybody in the room. Anybody know their parents are not saved? Raise your hand if you know your parents are not saved. Handfully, I was the first guy in my family to get saved too. I led my, my mom to Christ 30 days before she passed away. Great day for me. Led my dad to Christ in uh, July 2010. So I, I understand that. But many of us know our parents are saved. How many of you know your grandparents are saved? Raise your hand if you know your grandparents. Great grandparents. Anybody know if you're great grandparents? Anybody know that? I have a picture of my great grandmother holding a Tommy gun on a porch in Charleston, West Virginia, going, hey. She's part of the mafia, apparently. That's my heritage. And so I'm si- we know our great grandparents, great, 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 Adam and Eve. All I'm saying is this, is we, many of us in here have come from a heritage of Christianity. Great job. Awesome. The problem is in the Bible, every generation has a tendency to be a little further away from God than the generation before. If a woman showed her ankles 75 years ago, she was considered a prostitute. It's not that big a deal today. I'm just saying, have we slid away from God? Now, watch this now. Jesus tells the church in Ephesus, 34 years after Paul planted the church in Ephesus, he told them, you guys have left your first love. And if the next generation has lost their first love, the next generation has lost, we might be so far away from God, so let's just get back to the basics about what salvation is. Just the basics. Just the, the only place in the entire Bible where the definition word believe is given. Because I beg God that everybody out there would do one of two things in this message. Number one, truly believe. Or number two, get on the field and help others to believe. Get on the court. Sorry about not giving volleyball. It's equal to. Get on the court and smash them. Easy. So verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. Nicodemus would have known what he was talking about. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Am I supposed to go back up into my mom and be born? Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh. You've been born of water. You need to be born of the Spirit. And then he says, and Nicodemus in essence says, I don't believe. Jesus says, how can you be a teacher of Israel and not believe? And he drops on him right there the gospel bomb. Just as Moses, Nicodemus, think about what he's thinking. Nicodemus is going, he taught Moses probably the week before. I don't know for sure, but I'm just guessing here. He taught Moses a lot. Just as Moses, Nicodemus is going, I know Moses, lifted up the snake in the desert. He says, I know that passage. Four months ago, I preached it. I'm just making that up. Just relax. I'm sorry. Bill Jones makes me think truth all the time. That's good. So I'm sitting there, I'm sit, and Nicodemus is sitting there listening to Jesus, said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. Anybody in the room, other than the professors, anybody in the, in the room know where Moses lifted up the snake is in the Bible? Where's it at? Numbers? We're close, we're close. Numbers? Not 24. <laughs> it is 20. 21. One, two, okay. Verses 4 through 9. Go, go, go. All right, you get a famous award. You ready? Add a girl. Okay, here we go. So Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. The, uh, 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 the people grew impatient on the way. They traveled around Mount Or to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God, against Moses. They've been in the desert now for 38 years. Anybody know how many years they're going to be in the desert? Quick, quick, quick. We've got to go. We've got to go. We've got to go. 40 years. They're, they're traveling around Mount Or to go around Edom. So you got the Dead Sea over here, but like going around that. Travel around Mount Or to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God, against Moses, and they said, Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Anybody know the name of the miserable food? Quick. Manna. Anybody know what manna means in Hebrew? Quick. Ha! Ah, Bible college! <laughs> Nobody knows that. It means what is it? Imagine me coming home. Because y'all are smart people. You know it means what is it. But do you really know? Imagine me coming home scratching, lift up the food. Lisa's pouring her soul into the groceries and making my favorite dish. And I walk in the room going, Ugh. I lift up the lens and I say, Lisa, what is that? Trevor, you know my bride. That's what it, I'd be wearing the groceries. 
That's what it is. I'll tell you. That's what God, the Israelites disrespected God every time they called it manna. <laughs> God didn't call it manna, doctor. He didn't call it manna. He called it the bread of angels, Psalm 78, 25. But they called it manna. Hey, I don't blame them. They had manna mush for breakfast every day. Kept all of it in their manna refrigerator. Manna cotty, manna, manna, banana bread. I'm just saying it was, they got used to God, complained against God. We don't like this food anymore. Because they complained, the Lord wanted them to be a light to the world, to this people group over here and this people group over here. Because they turned inward, the Lord wanted to get their attention. I think it's verse 6, maybe verse 5, verse 6. The Lord sent venomous snakes among them. The snakes bit the people, and many Israelites died. Now, I'm not afraid of snakes. My wife's horrified of snakes. I saw this snake I'm getting ready to show you in the zoo over here. It scared me. A week later, it struck the glass and died in the zoo. Six feet long, go ahead and put the picture up. Can y'all see that snake? It's a sand viper. I talked to people from the southern Saudi Arabian, uh, where the war was over there in Desert Storm. In the southern Saudi Arabian area, there would have been, he said, thousands of these sand vipers all over the area. Thousands. And this sand viper, I walked around the corner, I see that snake there. I said, Lisa, look at that snake. I bet you can't find it. It sounded chill. I wanted her to have that same joy, that same peace that surpasses understanding. And so I said, look at that snake. She couldn't find it. She ended up four inches from it, turned and looked at it, and she about died. I'm saying that's the nastiest, evil Satan snake on the planet. Has a nasty nature about it, like a moccasin. Caused the blood to, the red blood cells would elongate and get torn open at the ends, and so they couldn't get through the capillaries to exchange the oxygen. And so the liquid part would go through, and your hands would swell up the club hand, but the blood pressure would keep increasing until you die from what's called internal hemorrhaging because the, red, the capillaries would tear open. And your organs would get filled up with blood, and it was nasty. G Nicodemus would have known what I just told you. How they died. He would have known that. Very important. So they came to Moses and they said, Moses, we sinned. Listen carefully. Please. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 is one of the most important gospel verses in the entire Bible. And, well, let me just see. How many of you have 2 Corinthians 7, 10 memorized? Raise your hand. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 memorized? Oh, my stars. Do Dr. Jones, would you please just raise your hand so the people can... Not, okay, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Godly sorrow. I'll start it for you. God, repeat it with me. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation, and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow leads to death. The Israelites, for the first time in 38 years, had what's called godly sorrow. For the first time, they said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you, Moses. First time they ever said that. All ten times before this, they had a plague against them in the desert there. The Mara, the different things like that that happened. All the diff ten different times they said, Moses, we're sorry when we sinned against you. This is the first time they realized their sins were against God. That's what happened to me when I walked into my room drunk the first day of two days in college football. And my roommate is reading his Bible. And for the first time ever, I saw my sins crushing the heart of Jesus. If that has not happened to you, you've never truly given yourself to Christ. You must realize that your sins have hurt Jesus. And be willing to say, Jesus, I am sorry. I remember that weeping that first morning. I had 31 sins come to my mind. I said, Lord, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Have you ever had that response to the Lord where you saw your sins crushing his heart? I saw me lying to my mom the week before about smoking marijuana. She said, you don't smoke dope, do you, son? I said, no, mom, I'm not stupid. There's a reason why they call it dope, you know. And I was high. Lied right to her face. And for the first time ever, I saw it crushing her heart and crushing the heart of Jesus. Until that happens, until it happens like it happened in the desert there, we sin when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Our sin goes in like a, a rock, bounces up vertically, the splash goes up against God and horizontally against our friends. Israelite said, we sin when we spoke against the Lord and against you. What do we do? Moses goes to God and says, they sinned. What do we do? God says, Moses, make a snake out of bronze. Put the next picture up. Make a snake out of bronze. Put it up on a pole. Then whenever someone's bitten by a snake, all they have to do is look at the snake on a pole and they'll get healed. Time out, God. Time out, God. Time out, God. Why not just take the snakes away? Because he knew you'd be here this morning. And his sovereignty, this message is for us. Isn't that interesting? All right, definition of word belief. Here it is. Walking through the desert, get bitten by a snake. Bam! Comes out of nowhere. 
I've, any of you guys ever been bitten by a snake before? Raise your hand. Hey, I heard it hurts. Does it hurt? Was it a po 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 positive snake? Was it a poisonous snake? Did it hurt? Someone told me it feels like he got shot. I've never been shot, so I don't know. But so, did it hurt or not? Yes. Very big. I love your hair, man. I wish I could, I could spend like a week in there. <laughs> Look at his hair. I get lost in there. All right, so did it hurt or not? Make it, make it big. Like a, here, stand up so they can see you in the back. Not that you need to stand up to be seen in the back, okay? So tell them, did it hurt or not? Yes. Yeah, it hurt. Okay, good, 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 good. You bit by a snake, bam, hurts like crazy. That's what I've heard. How do you know in this room if I believe that looking at that thing will heal me? How do you know if I believe it or not? Say it again. No, no, no. Use your diaphragm. I'm looking at it. No, no, stand up. Stand up. Hurry up. Use your diaphragm, use your hands. Golly, you're a big man. What in the world? Okay. Hot up, hot up. Give me some. By looking at it. No, no, no. A little stronger, man. The, the people. I'm looking at it. Ah, good. All right. Definition of the word believe is looking at it. So how did they look at it? Did they look at it, get healed? I've never kind of been healed before. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I have. I think I had a heart issue one time, got healed. But uh, did it burn? Did it make a little flicker? And they looked around and went, Praise God. You think they were bored in the desert? I know that looks stupid, but do you think they were bored in the desert? Let me just answer it quickly. No! Definition word believe. Get bitten by a snake. How do you know if I believe it or not? You know if I believe it? If I, if I look at it. The passion in my soul to see the very thing the only chance I have of getting healed. The, if you put a big tent, the defensive lineman for the Kansas City Chiefs, they couldn't stop me. Faces all stuck in their helmet. Did you see them? Could they stop you if that's the only chance you had? Doesn't matter how big you are. Would you not chew your way through them? I'll just say this now. The desire to be healed of a snake bite Ladies and gentlemen, is a definition of word belief. Let's say somebody 20 miles from the snake on a pole gets bitten by a snake and they can't walk and they're your friend. Would you carry them to see the snake on a pole? I'm sorry, it sounded like you said. Is that Yiddish? I don't speak Yiddish. Would you carry your friend to see the snake on a pole, yes or no? Yes. What if they were your enemy? A yes or no? Yes. They wouldn't be your enemy anymore, that's for sure. We need to get on the field. 95% of people who go to church today have never led someone else to Christ. Reese Barnapole says 97% do not consistently talk about Jesus to anybody. Bring it home. Verse 14 of John 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 33. Next picture, Jesus was talking about the way he would die. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. That everyone who believes, definition word believe, I've been bitten by a snake called sin. And I deserve separation from God. The only chance of me getting healed is by believing. So what is believing? Oh yeah, sure, I believe. Nope, it's... <sighs> I got up. Definition word believe is I want that more than I want air. I want that more than I want air. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the definition of the word believe. It's not, oh yeah, sure, I believe in intellectual assent. It's I believe with everything I've got in me. And if you have believed like that, which many of us have, have we come here to study and said, my evangelism needs to be put on the back burner? Or are we evangelizing the city? 
I love to take our collective fists and punch the enemy in the face when horrible things happen. So let's put all the verses together. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. And anyone who believes would have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes should not perish forever in hell, but forever and forever and forever would have eternity in heaven. I think the Lord wants us to believe. And for those of us who have believed already, I think the Lord wants us to tell others. Let's pray. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that everybody in the room would believe. I figure, Papa, the only way possible is if you do it. And for those of us who have already believed, I pray we'd get in the game. We'd get on the field. I can't imagine having 85,000 players on the field. We'd score every play. <laughs> against the enemy's 22. I mean, against the enemy's 11. We'd score every play. Goal. Okay, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed for just a second, because we're running out of time. How many of you would like to say, you know what, Lord, that's the way I want to believe. I've never truly believed like that. I want to believe like what's demonstrated with everything I've got in me. That's the way I want to believe. I've never truly believed like that, and I want to now. I'm sorry about my sins, and I truly want to believe in you, as if I know that's the only chance I have. Would you raise your hand in the air? Just raise them up high. Just say to God, yep, that's the way I want to believe. Raise them up high. Hurry up. Take your time. Hurry up. you got 10 seconds. Nine, eight. Good. Seven, six. Hurry up. Five, four, three, two, one. Go put your hands down. How many of you have believed like that, but you've not been bringing people to Christ like you know you're supposed to? And you'd like to get in the game. You want to get on the court. You want to get. Raise your hand now if that's you. If you want to like say to God, that's me right now. That's me right now. Raise your hands up high. Hurry up. Five seconds. Four, three, two, one. In Jesus' name, amen. All eyes open. All eyes look around. Whoever would like to say, we're going to do this quickly. Whoever would like to say, you know what, Lord? I want to give you my life. I want to believe in you the way I'm supposed to believe in you. And the other group of people, if, if, if um, Lord, I believe in you, but I want to bring people to Christ. I want all of you to stand up at the same time. Ready? Go. Hurry up. All of you stand up at the same time. Hurry up. Take your time. Bow your heads right where you are. You need to know that you weren't the only person in the room who raised their hands saying they wanted to give their lives to Christ. There were a myriad in here. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray quietly to yourself. Lord, I'm sorry about my sins. I surrender or resurrender my life to you. And I want, to get, I want others to know, would you give me souls? Would you give me their names? For the people who are seated, would you stand up and put your hands on their backs and pray for them quietly? Quietly? Just pray for them quietly. Those of you who are seated, who are already on the, on the field, you're already on the field, pray that these people will be equipped to go and to make disciples. So you pray now. Hallelujah. 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 I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you'd be seen and heard clearly throughout this time of mourning. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name that you would touch this school with your presence in a way that can only be explained by the Spirit of God doing it. Thank you for setting many free this morning. Pray in Jesus' name.